Hi everyone, thank you really for introducing me. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so my name is Jonathan Goldsmith, and today we're going to talk about code performance for Python internals, or how knowing some parts of the Python internals can help you write faster Python code. Take my clicker. A bit about myself, I gained most of my experience from the IDF, I suppose like many of us here. Um, today I'm a team lead at Granulate's research department. Uh, Granulate is a company that was recently acquired by Intel, by the way. Uh, we help companies optimize their workloads and leverage that to reduce costs and improve the application performance. As part of helping companies optimize their workloads, we study performance and I'm going to talk about and share the tips and learnings from some of what I've learned. Um, I also like wine, which is my picture from Italy. <laughs> okay, so if you're in the Python ecosystem for a while, I suppose you've seen many of these sad diagrams online. Now, well, sadly, I'm no magician, so Despite we're going to talk about performance, we will not improve your application uh, to match Java and C and Node.js. So if you want to reach those levels of performance, I hear there's Node.js con going now in some other university around here. You can try that one. Uh, but no, Python is the best. Um, what can we do then to improve our performance if we'll never reach those levels? Well. The ecosystem offers plenty of opportunities from different frameworks like uh, Namba and Pandas that were referenced in Mickey's uh, talk before, to different profilers that help us pinpoint bottlenecks in our code, and even different Python implementations. We we all use C Python. I'm going to talk about C Python in this session, but there are also different implementations like PyPy, which may offer better performance for your application. And we can al always just improve the algorithms of our code, like replace a faster a sort algorithm, stuff like that. But today, I'm not going to talk about any of those. Those are for another talk or other talks in plural. Today, we're going to focus CPython itself, and specifically version 3.10 uh, to be on the latest side, and see how knowing CPython can help us code better, or write faster code. So what is Python itself? I'm going to refer it as the interpreter, but when I say the interpreter, I actually refer the entire Python runtime. The interpreter itself is, we can say, a component that takes our Python code, Python text code, and compiles it to some bytecode, and then executes this bytecode, one instruction by one instruction, to actually get a computer to do what our code wants to do. Under the hood, the interpreter and the Python runtime have lots of other components that you know, just magically help our code do its job, like the garbage collector and the import machinery and many, many other components. They all, they all work together to, uh, to actually take a piece of text of, of Python code and have it run with the Python semantics that we all understand and love. So why should I care about all of those components? Well, the interpreter and the runtime and Basically, all code in the C Python source code, they try to run our code and they try to do it the best way they can. But they have their limitations. They are, you know, C Python itself is just a piece of C code that is full of ifs and loops and, you know, constructs of code. And if we help them do their job better, they will run our code faster. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, most of this talk will be many demos that I've prepared. Uh, I hope they'll be fun. I personally really like this area of uh, interpreter and runtime optimizations. However, I don't expect you to actually remember everything I talk about. The idea here is to open your mind to know that there's this interpreter thing and if you take care of it to some extent, your code might behave better. It's just to open your mind to this idea. You don't need to remember everything. You don't need to understand everything. I just wanted to get this simple idea of the way I write my code, although behaving semantically the same, it matters. It matters for performance, it matters for memory. Now let's start. 
Most of the demos today will revolve around dictionaries, which are a key component in Python, not only as data structures that we use um, when we load a JSON or a message back or whatever, but also under the hood in CPython itself. For example, we'll talk later about global variables, uh, which are variables that are accessed in the module level. They are actually part of the dictionary of a module. Every function that I define in a module is actually a global variable, which is an entry in this module's dictionary. So dictionaries are used throughout Python in many, many areas, and a typical Python program can spend about 10% of its CPU time doing things around dictionaries. So it's important that dictionaries behave good uh, or behave performant. Okay. So all those dicks to us as developers and users of Python, they behave the same. We can load keys, we can store keys, uh, we can iterate over keys. But under the hood, different dictionaries that implement different things from dictionaries that implement global variables to dictionaries that implement instance attributes to dictionaries that I use when I load a JSON object, they may have different implementations for optimizing performance of different hot paths that, that are used in those dictionaries. And now we'll see some examples of how having a dictionary using the most optimal uh, lookup for its type um, helps it behave much faster and once we have it destroyed, once we get the dictionary to use a non-optimal lookup function, it starts behaving much slower. So now let's do a demo. Let's start IPython. All right. So for these demos, I've prepared a utility uh, that is available on, in GitHub if any of you later want to take a look that lets us inspect the inner structures of CPython, the PyDict object and PyKeys uh, object, PyDict keys object, which we will we will talk about them later and see the internal structure, but generally just a bunch of Python code that prints the internals of those structures. We will start with this demo. Look up impulse. Let's copy this line. Okay, so I'm creating a dictionary with 100 keys that are strings. They refer to integers, but I'm also, I'm, I'm only talking about the keys type here. So we have another keys, which are strings, and we have this nice dictionary here, and we can print uh, the attributes of this dictionary this way. We'll talk about the different uh, attributes here later. For now, I'm focusing on the lookdict function, uh, which here is lookdict unicode no dummy, and we'll see exactly what those uh, no dummy and unicode mean a bit later. So the final small function that forces Python to do a lookup for this dict uh, 10,000 times, just to take a while, and we can time time it um, how much does it takes. So let's have it run. So that it takes. Well, previously it took about 400 microseconds, but it's a laptop, so you can't trust performance. But if you run it multiple times, we'll say that it's around 360, 400 microseconds per loop. Now, I'm going to delete an entry. When I delete an entry, we'll now see that the dictionary becomes lookedict unicode. What happens here is that Python for dictionaries that uh, were never had a key deleted, it can use a faster function that does not have to take into account the possibility of a key slot being deleted. The lookup is faster this way because there's just a few less checks that Python has to do. So the moment I delete the key, um, I destroy this attribute of a dictionary that it has no dummy entries, and the lookup might become a bit slower. We can measure it now. I don't think this effect is very visible. Indeed, I don't see any any big difference, but there should be a difference because the CPython code devs, they have written two different functions, so I'm sure there was a cause. But now, let's do a harder change. Now I inserted a key that is not a string. You see all keys are string, and I have one key that is an integer. If I print the dictionary now, I can see that it's using lookdict and not lookdict unicode. And now if we measure, we've timed it, performance should degrade by about 20%, uh, or even a bit more. 
What happens here is that Python has the lookdict unicode and lookdict unicode dummy functions, which are optimized for lookups in dictionaries that have only string keys. Then comparison can be faster. Python does not have to take into account the possibility of an object implementing dunder hash and dunder eq, uh, which if an object implements, then the dictionary lookup needs to call into those methods. Think about it. When I look a key in a dictionary, I have to, I, I don't know in advance which type it's going to be. So the lookup function has to check whether it's an integer or a string or any random object, has to find its hash function, has to find its equal function. If the dictionary knows that all keys are string, then Python will use the optimized one, the Unicode variant, which just runs the Unicode uh, comparison function, which just saves code <laughs> for our computer, therefore it's faster. Now, the cool thing about this optimization is that it's seamless. I didn't need to tell Python this is a string only dictionary, it just worked. When a dictionary starts, it starts as a strings only. And the moment I insert any key that is not string only, I destroy it. Now, the sad thing here is that this optimization is not recoverable. The moment I added a non-string key into a dictionary, it will never revert back to be a, a, a dictionary that uses the string lookup function. So if you have dictionaries that are often looked up throughout, try to make sure that they are only string keys and never delete or insert a key that is not a string. That will degrade greatly the performance of lookups. So that's it for the first demo. Let's go back to the slides. Now, again, reminding, while this seems a bit insignificant, it's just in the nanosecond scale, it turned from 360 microseconds to 450 microseconds. It's not, it's not much, right? It's just microseconds. But again, remember that a typical Python program can spend more than 10% of its time doing dictionary lookups just in the Python environment. Not if your program has a dictionary da data structures that it has to look up. Just the Python environment itself can spend 10% of the time doing lookups. So you have to maintain fast lookups in your dictionaries if you care about performance. That's it. All right. Now for the second example, and for that, I'll have to explain a bit about the structure of dictionaries. So in Python, since Python 3 at least, dictionary objects are um, in the C side. They are referred by an object called PyDict object, which refers an object called PyDict keys object, which is the core of the dictionary. A PyDict keys object has an array called DK indexes and an array called DK entries. When I do a lookup of a key, Python takes the key, computes its hash, and uses the hash to look to look up through the DK indexes array. This is actually the hash table of a dictionary. I get an index from the DK indexes array, and I use it to index the DK entries. The DK entry is now an array of key and value, and Python just has to compare that the, my key actually matches the key in the DK entries because there can be hash collisions, so it has actually to compare the key for equality. And once it finds an entry uh, with a matching key, it can return back the value. So that's basically how dictionaries work. Now you, you can ask what's the, the reason for this extra object by dict keys? Because it seems that a PyDict object just fulfills this keys object and it doesn't have anything else. So the reason why it was added was to support key sharing dictionaries. This is a simple example of how the dictionary of an instance look like, looks like. Under the hood, instances, unless you're using slots, they are based off on a dictionary. So each instance that you create from a class you define has a dictionary and all attributes that you assign are entries in this dictionary. Now, if you look at this example, you can clearly see that there's a great waste here because the DK indexes in both cases is the same. And the DK entries is an array of the same size and the keys are the same objects and only the values differ because these are different instances with different values. But again, most of the structures here are just the same. So what can be done? So in Python, I think 3.3 three, three or 3.4, three uh, key sharing dictionaries were added. And the idea is that specifically for instance uh, dictionaries, for uh, dictionaries that 
all the attributes of instances, we can share the same PyDict keys object, which will hold the DK indexes array and the DK entries array, and just the values can be kept on the PyDict object itself. So different objects, different dictionaries of the same class will refer to the single PyDict keys object, but will have their own values array. What happens here is that we basically cat by more than two, two to three X, the memory consumption of each individual object, which is massive. In a typical Python program, it, utilizing this can save you about 20% of memory, at least for, from my experience. Now again, as I said in previous, on the previous uh, optimization, this thing is seamless. You don't have to enable it. You don't have to ask Python to use it. It will just work until you mess it up. And I will see how this can get messed up. Uh, uh, uh. I've prepared another demo, which is a very unorthodox example of uh, simple dumb uh, OOP programming, but forgive me for that. Uh, <laughs> it displays the purpose I try to, try to give it. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so I define a small animal class uh, that has multiple different attributes. Um, name, species, age, and perhaps sound and smell if the animal is uh, noisy or smelly. So I'll start with a fish, which is neither noisy nor smelly, so it has no sound and no smell. And I can define it. And I use the print uh, dict all, which prints the same attributes and prints the entries themselves. Now we can see here uh, two interesting things. First is the keys. We See the keys ref count. If you've been in uh, Mickey's talk before, he talked about ref counts. Uh, a ref count is how many different Python objects ref, uh, hold a reference to my object. So we see that the keys object that is used by Flipper the fish has two references. One reference is the dict of Flipper itself. That is flipper.dict. It's a dictionary object. It has a dictionary keys object, which means that it holds one ref count on that object. The second ref count comes from the class itself. The animal class now holds a reference to this keys object as well, because if I'll create another animal object, it should be using the same keys object because multiple instances of the same class should be having the same attributes, right? Uh, additionally, we, we can see that the size is about 104 bytes, which is nice. It's small, rather small compared to a Python object. Uh, and it's using a lookup function called lookdict split, which is the lookdict function, the lookup function Python uses for dictionaries that are using a key sharing dictionaries, that they have their keys separated uh, in another object. Now I'll create another animal, funky the skunk, and I can print it. We will see that the keys ref count has increased by one because now there's another object referring it. The size is, is still quite small, and the lookup function is still look dict split. We can see also that the keys has one more entry that is usable, that can be used by additional keys. We now define Milo, the cat. It has a sound. Notice that the skunk had the smell, so I had to add the smell attribute, and the cat had the sound, so I had to add the sound attribute. Now see what happened here. First thing, we're not using anymore the look dict split function. So this dictionary is on its own. It has the keys and the values merged together. Its size is also tripled from 104 to 360. And we can see that the keys size is, the keys has only one ref count because it's no longer shared with the keys of other objects of this class. If I look again at, uh, at let's say flipper, print it all flipper, Dict. Yeah, you're correct. Assertions. I like assertions. Uh, we can see that it now has only two ref counts. Previously, this dictionary keys object had three one for the class, one for the skunk, and one for the fish. Now it has only two. What happened here is that the class animal it has given up on using key sharing dictionaries because it says you're not sharing the same attributes. You're adding attributes at runtime. So there's no, this optimization is nice, but if you're not using it, then there's no, 
every optimization it requires some extra efforts to track and to follow. So if you're not using it, then this extra effort is a waste and I should not be attempting it at all. And indeed, if I create now a fish, another fish from the same class and print it, it will not be using the look the split function anymore. It's again using its brand new dictionary and you can see that its size is doubled, more than doubled, which is bad. Now, what happened here? I destroyed key sharing dictionaries for this class. It will never use key sharing, di key sharing dictionaries again, unless I redefine it or like exit the interpreter and try it again. If I do it now again, obviously it will be using key sharing dictionaries, but I had to either redefine the class or restart my Python, which is bad. Now it is again, look at this split. Now, Let's see in our example. We restart the interpreter. Let's do it again. And we create a, I can just do it this way. And we create a cat. And it's now shared. It's all good. We have, we see two references for the dict keys object and we see that it's using look dict split. Now we will call the mute method, quite a brutal name, which deletes the sound attributes of my object. I'll do it now. Oh. And I will print the attributes of this dictionary again. And voila, it's no longer a key chain dictionary. It's also, if you notice, it's not the no dummy variant because it's a dictionary which had a key deleted. So it's using just the loop dict unicode method. And again, if I now create another animal, and print it again, it's no longer using the look dict split function. What I'm gonna do is again, I messed up with Python's seamless optimization and it said, okay, you're not using it, then I'm disabling it for this class and you will just not have it anymore. Only if I redefine the class, it will now, it will now um, be back to look dict split. Now, the way to combat that is to make sure that you define all attributes in the constructor. Even if you don't plan to use them on an object based on some conditions, you need to define all attributes in all constructor calls. Never define attributes under a conditional statement. Now, this thing is seamless, but again, once broken, it will never uh, be recovered for the same class unless I restart my interpreter. Um, the abort points, I think I have an example of them here from the C code. Uh, one is once I delete an item uh, from a dictionary, if it has a cached keys, then delete them and the comment clearly says, um, we don't support deletion, there's no reason to support deletion, so we, we, we stop trying to, to support key sharing dictionaries. And if we have to resize the keys, because we keep adding attributes and at some point the arrays in the keys object, they, they have to be enlarged to support more entries. Then if we have to resize and the ref count of the keys is more than one, then we delete the key sharing dictionaries. By the way, the reason to support resizing when the ref count is just one is to support resizing in the first constructor call of your class. If your class holds more than five entries, then it will have to resize the dictionary at least once because key, uh, dictionaries in Python, they, they begin with five usable keys. So the moment you add more than four, the moment the fifth key is added, the dictionary will be resized. Now we want to support this optimization for classes with more than five dictionary entries. So upon the very first constructor call, before any other object is using the same, is using the same uh, uh, PyDict keys object, then we allow enlarging it only once. If you do it ever again, it will not, it will disagree and uh, abort on this optimization. Now, the tips are clear, I think. Never delete instance attributes. It's bad, very bad for memory, for the memory consumption of your program. And um, make sure all entries are added in every constructor call. Do not add entries under any conditional statement. It's bad. Now, a word on slots and uh, one back. A word on slots. Uh, also, Mickey referenced them in his session. Slots are good and they are a very archaic feature, which was here way before key sharing dictionaries were here. 
they are not seamless and they require you to define extra attributes on classes to, to tell Python which, which attributes are going to be used and then Python will give up on using a dictionary and will just store a static array of the entries uh, of the entries of the attributes that your class instances will be using. Slots, in my eyes, are a waste of time when you have key sharing dictionaries. They do give slightly better performance compared to, uh, compared to this method, but they are not seamless and they require extra effort. So if you don't have to, don't use them. Just make sure that you don't break this optimization. Now, this thing also improves CPU performance, not only memory, and I will give, if we have time, I'll give a slight examples on that later. Now, another demo about global variables and built-ins. Not surprisingly, they are also based on dictionaries like most of the things in the Python runtime. Uh, when I do a global lookup, when I refer to a name that is not defined in my function, for example, I call the, the, the method print, Python looks it up in the globals of my function, which for a typical function are the dictionary object of the model in which it was defined. So it can access other functions in the same module and other variables defined in the top level. If Python doesn't find a global satisfying the, the name I looked up, it will look up the built-ins dictionary, which is a dictionary shot across the entire Python, Python runtime and contains names like print and len and dict and exception and uh, I don't know, all, all, all types of built-in exception names, etc. So whenever I do, uh, whenever I refer a name in a function that is not defined, is, is not local to the function, Python runs a global lookup. And then a built-in lookup if the global lookup has failed. Now globals are very common and are used throughout Python basically everywhere. And dictionaries are slow. So a solution was sought. What Python does since Python 3.8 is a method called inline caches, which I'll explain about later. But basically what happens is if I have a function that refers to a global variable, Python knows, by the way, that this is a global variable because it's never assigned to inside a function. So the Python bytecode emitted for this function will be a load global opcode that refers to the name that I wanted to load. And what Python does is it places an inline cache on this opcode. Now, an inline cache, uh, simply put, is a cache in the site of an operation, contrary to a cache on the cold site. Most caches that we use are sites in the cold site. We, we place a function decorator on, on a function that we want to cache in Python. We, we use the decorator from functools to place a cache or an, an LRU cache on a function. An inline cache, on the other end, is not a cache on the cold function. We don't call any function here. It's a cache in the site of the operation. So each load global opcode in your Python program, it has a small cache attached, and we will now see how this cache works. To support this kind of caching, Python has a concept called dictionary versions. Basically, there's a counter in C Python sources that is 64-bit, and whenever you make any change in any dictionary, this counter is incremented by one, and the value is assigned to the dictionary field to the dictionary version field that each and every one of the dictionaries in a program has. This way, Python can know, given a dictionary object, if the version has changed, then something has happened to this dictionary. A version uniquely identifies the state of a dictionary across all other dictionaries in the program and across all changes possibly made, being made to this dictionary. So on the right, uh, we have a function in that model that prints the version of a dictionary. We can see that I call it twice on the same dictionary and it remains the same. Once I assign a value, the version changes. Now, what the inline cache of Flow Global does is very simple. It has stored the, uh, the version of the global's dictionary and of the built-ins dictionary, and it just compares them to the version that those two dictionaries now have. If the version in the case of the two dictionaries match, then both the globals and the built-ins have not changed since the last time this opcode is executed. And we can just use the value that was look at, looked at before without performing any dictionary lookup. And in some cases, it's actually two lookups because when I access the print function, it is always first looked up in my globals. I don't have it in my globals because nobody defines a function called print all n. Don't do that. It's confusing. Um, so 
it doesn't find it in my globals, so it looks it up in my builders. And with this cache, it doesn't have to do any lookup at all because the cache usually works. So we'll now see a demo of what happens when I break this cache and how it affects performance. For this demo, I've defined a small, quite contrived function, which just loads a global variable. Also, models that I import are globals. It just loads it 16 times, I think. Um, again, not very typical of a Python program, but just to, um, to pass the meaning or the purpose of what I try to explain. Now, th this function can receive a Boolean, and if this Boolean is true, it will destroy the cache it will edit a global variable in this module, which will now flash, cause a flash of all inline, of all global inline caches defined in this uh, module. In this case, it's just this function. So uh, for this, I have uh, global. Okay, so I define the function. Let's have a clean interpreter. I don't trust Python anymore. <laughs> Something was messed up here. Um, so we can see, how this function looks like. It has many, many load global uh, opcodes. Each and every one of them has its own inline cache defined. They don't show the cache. Each opcode has its own cache. That's why it's called an inline cache. So we can start by displaying the version of the, uh, the load global cache um, module. You see, I'm actually loading um, model from uh, using a function from another module, not the module that I execute stuff in, because once I execute, I run lines here, they they modify the dictionary. So if I define the, the demo and those uh, snippets in the same module, when I run those lines, it will destroy the cache every time. So it will mess up with performance. So I define it in a separate module. And I will now, I printed the version. You can see the number, it remains the same. And I can time it, I think I'll limit it to 5 million because otherwise it will be too slow. Uh, and I passed false, so it will not destroy the cache. Uh, let it run, and it should take about, yeah, something like that, uh, 117 nanoseconds per uh, function call. We can, we can try it again, just see that I'm not lying to. Um, and if we check the version again, we expect it to be the same because nothing was written to the dictionary of that module. What I'll do now is run it again, this time uh, destroying the cache, every call. So now it's about one and a half X slower, uh, which is bad. Um, and yeah, quite consistent. And we can also see that after every call, the version changes because each call does many, many assignments to the, to the dictionary. Yeah, I should have run it again. It has changed. Now, one cool thing about this optimization, uh, different from the previous two ones uh, that we saw, is that if I run it again without flashing the cache, oh, and I ran it without the limit, oh, it will take a bit of time, but you will see that it's not, uh, it's fast again. This optimization, unlike the previous ones, is self-healing. So once you cause a cache flash, it will flash the ca all caches uh, of all load global opcodes that use the same set of globals. But once the cache reheals, then performance is back on par with what was before, which is cool. Just showing that it remains again at the 180 uh, area. You good? Cool. Okay. So, yes, this cache is self-filling, which is very good for us as developers. If all optimizations were self-filling, then I wouldn't have to be standing here today and talk with you about it because everything would just work. But not everything just worked. This specific one uh, works pretty well, but uh, not all of them. Now, you, you may ask, uh, how does it relate to real code? Because, well, Again, this example was very, very contrived, and I, I don't expect that any of you have written any code that looks like loading the same global 16 times. Again, check this example out. Um, it's a snippet from Celery, I think. Uh, you don't have to read the code. I just took a screenshot, a long screenshot, to, to demonstrate how large Python files can be. 
This is a single module. So all functions in this module, they share the same set of globals. And it's enough for one function to write one small global variable, and bam, all caches are flashed out. And all functions that the next time they execute, they won't have the cache. They will have to regenerate it, which is bad. So they, they often say don't use global variables because uh, blah, blah, blah. It means your design is bad and all that. It also <laughs> means bad things for performance. So try not to use them. Uh, now, another thing on inline caches, since Python 3.10, the load atter, load atter opcode, which is the opcode used, used when you use the dot operator, um, it also has an inline cache. It will recall, it will remember which offset was actually used uh, for each dictionary load, and the next time it runs, it will try to use the same offset, and it, if it matches a matching entry, it will just uh, will just return this entry without doing any lookup at all. So again, if we head back to the example of the fish class, of the animal class, if you define, if you have the same class defined and you insert attributes in different order, or you, you have your dictionary structured and it's laid out differently, then the load attribute cache will not work for your class. And you will suffer uh, some bad penalty or performance effect. Now, I wanted to give a word on other languages, but I have only five minutes left, so I think I'll skip that. But basically, none of the concepts I talked about here are unique to Python. And actually, Python is, is, the, is the, the late child. I mean, all other languages are much more uh, developed in this area. Java and Node.js, that is based on V8, they have many, many more inline caches and other types of optimizations that help your code be much faster. And that's why Java and Node.js are faster than Python. Um, since they have many, many more optimizations, you have much more to gain and you have much more to lose. I actually had an example, but we'll skip it, but I had an example demonstrating inline caches in Node. And once I mess them up, code performance doesn't become one, dot, one and a half X slower, it becomes about 20 X slower, like much, much slower. So with other languages, you have to care more about, uh, about the way you, you handle the runtime and the interpreter. Uh, I put it two interesting reads from a VA developers that writes very nicely about, about performance and about taking care of the interpreter and runtime uh, to, like, to help your code. And the top one is a read where he took a snippet and he improved it by about 5x, I think, uh, just by applying these techniques over and over again until he reached the performance that he wanted to have. Now, Shortly on the future of CPython, CPython is getting uh, boosted. All of the concepts I talked about now are on the focus um, in 3.11 and 3.12 and 3.13. It's currently being taken care of by Guido, which is back to working on the core Python and together with some other core developers. They, are, they have a plan, it's called Faster CPython, you can look it up online. They have a plan of adding many, many more optimizations like the ones we have discussed to have your code run like they aim at 4x in Python 3.13. And from my experience with 3.11, which is not released yet, but there's an alpha version uh, Docker image, it's about 1.7x one and one and 1 .7x faster for a typical demo. So you can try it out. And you can forget everything I said today and just upgrade to 3.11 and your code will be faster and life is good. So I'll give some takeaways. Um, Take a moment to look at these two snippets and uh, think for yourself which one is more Pythonic and which one is faster. And uh, I didn't request an answer, but clue, uh, it's not, the one that is more Pythonic is not the faster one. Now, the purpose of this talk was not to make you unpythonize your code like displayed here. Obviously, if it's not obvious for anyone, then the second example is much faster. Um, but is much less readable. We like using uh, Simon filter and lambdas and, and stuff like that. This is Python. I'm not trying to make you unpythonize your code. We, we write Python, we, we come to this conference and not to, to JavaCon or Node.js.com because we like Python, because it's the best language. Um, and stuff that's in the Zen of Python, it's true. We, we need to follow those, like those sayings. But what I am saying is that just by being aware, by being aware to, to how things work under the hood, 
Not always you have to make uh, drastic changes like this one to improve performance. Oftentimes it's just small things. For example, me, as one who's aware of many of those ideas, often when I read Python code, I, I see just small things that if the developer would have known, he, would, he just would have written it differently and things would behave faster. So just those small things um, that can help you write a tad bit faster code. And again, personally, this is just cool. So <laughs> that's why I like giving this session. I like those uh, interpreter level and stuff. Now, another more important takeaway is that despite talking about different optimizations that can be applied on every Python code you have in your code base, your company, your projects, doing so without profiling is a waste of time. Never optimize without profiling. You are most likely, most certainly, optimizing code that is never executed or executed, not for effort, not the main bottleneck, not, not the CPU bottleneck of your program. So always start by optimizing, and always, always start by profiling. Never start by optimizing. Um, that's it, I think. And one final note, some of those snippets I displayed today are part of a project called WTF Python. It's very cool and it's full of snippets that demonstrate uh, many unique or interesting or bizarre features of Python. Some of them are performance oriented, some are not. Check it out, let's go. Cool.